This is Defenders TV Podcast, episode 131, about The Punisher, season 1, episode 10, Virtue of the Vicious. Welcome back, fellow defenders, to Virtue of the Vicious, episode 10 of The Punisher. Uh, we are on 131 of Defenders TV podcast. I am one of your hosts, John. And I'm your other host, Derek. I'm getting used to saying that now. Unfortunately, we don't have Chris again. We don't. He is currently being chased down by a pride of lions <laughs> in South Africa. I hope not. I hope his little feet can carry him to safety. <laughs> well, hopefully he'll be back next week uh, to tell us all about his trip to uh, to South Africa. It looks awesome. I'd love to go on safari at some point in the future. He's been very close to elephants. He's been very close to some other creatures of the night in uh, in South Africa. Uh, hopefully someday I'll get to do it. Uh, you've done it before, haven't you, John? I have, yeah. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, I always remember the guy at the camp that we stayed. We went on a a canoeing safari in the Okavanga Delta. Mm. And the one thing he said, he said, talking about lions, elephants in heat, uh, water buffalo, all these different things that you needed to do if confronted. Uh, and he always said about the crocodile and you won't know until it's dragging you down into the water. Oof. Just as another camp person popped along on crutches with just one leg. So I was like, okay, I'm not putting my hands in this water yes. at all. Yes, be very safe if you're out there. So you don't just come to Defenders TV podcast for our thoughts on The Punisher. You come to us for some interesting stories about South Africa as well. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes, other interesting tidbits that we can provide uh, yeah. along the way. Um and if you're interested in our little tidbits, well, then you can come on over and subscribe, review, and share the love of Defenders TV podcast on any good podcast catcher. We are on Google Play, Apple Podcasts, and whichever podcast catcher you love to listen to podcasts on, mm -hmm. please, you can head on over to DefendersTVPodcast.com and go to our subscribe section to choose which Ever platform you want to listen to us on and of course if you want to speak specifically about the defenders the punisher daredevil iron fist jessica jones then please come on over and join our facebook group over at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Defenders TV podcast. And of course, you can like our page on Facebook as well. Mm -hmm. And there's only three episodes left of our Punisher coverage after this episode. So if you want to get any thoughts into us, just make sure you send them into feedback at DefendersTVPodcast.com. And you can record a voicemail for us over at DefendersTVPodcast.com. If it's about the full season for our final episode, just say that in, in your opening sentence. And uh, we will discuss it on our final episode, episode 13, coming up in the next couple of weeks. Yes, come on, put those New Year's resolutions into action and send on over to us a voicemail absolutely and once we finish the punisher we will be moving on to the next marvel movie which is black panther coming out in the middle of Ooh. february uh, really looking forward to that. i'm looking forward to that mm. loads yeah. yeah yeah just watch the most recent tv spot trailer which was really interesting to see a bit more storyline for the character this looks like it's essential viewing before we get to uh, avengers infinity war during the summer and before we get to avengers infinity war we do have the second season of well definitely my favourite show I think we all said it, the three of us our favourite of the Defenders shows has been Jessica Jones so. yeah JJ is back yeah season 2 comes out in March so uh, yeah. looking forward to that but not on a Friday no no out on uh, out on International Women's Day yes and of course there's no better day for it to, to air on Mm -hmm, absolutely looking forward to seeing it but John shall we get into this episode yeah Derek what are some of the episode details Yep, this episode was written by Ken Christensen, a first-time writer for The Punisher. Uh, this is his first full credit for an episode, but he has is a staff writer on the entire season of the show, so has been in the writer's room for all the other episodes. I think you can tell that from, from this episode. Uh, lots of interesting little tying up of bows that have been going on so far this season. Uh, it was directed by Jim O'Hanlon, a UK director mostly. He's done a lot of work on UK TV, directed the first two episodes of the excellent BBC show In the Flesh. Uh, cool zombie story taken from a very different perspective. If you, if you have the chance to check it out, uh, definitely watch that. Yeah, absolutely loved that. And of course, it was 
up north. It was, yeah. A really good, uh, really good show. Check it out. Um, he also, great timing for this episode. It is, yeah. yes. He also directed next week, the January 19th episode of the wonderful, would you call it, black comedy series? Definitely. Uh, Inside number nine, um, with the characters created by um, Steve Pemberson and Reese Shearsmith from League of Gentlemen, uh, another show we absolutely love. This season has been very interesting. First episode, okay, pretty good. Second episode, probably one of the best things I've seen on TV for a long, long time. Uh, And now we're coming up on the third episode, Once Removed, which is out next week, directed by Jim O'Hanlon. So we've chosen a really good week to do this episode. Yeah, definitely. Uh, And Jim does not disappoint uh, in this episode Mm. either. All right, John, do you want to tell us what he gave us with your synopsis for the episode? Sure. Detective Brett Mahoney interviews Paige, Madani, Russo, and Senator Ari individually to determine the proper sequence of events surrounding an assassination attempt on the Senator. Each interviewee can recount the attack from radically different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Six hours earlier, after learning that the mercenaries who killed Stein are connected to Anvil, Madani confronts Russo at the hotel where his men are providing security for Senator Ari as he sits down for an interview with Paige. During the interview, Lewis, who previously infiltrated the hotel after killing one of Russo's men and stealing his uniform, barges into Ori's suite with a gun. Castle arrives and shields the two from the gunfire, only for Lewis, who is wearing a suicide vest, to take Paige hostage. Castle then flees when the Anvil agents open fire on him. Fighting off Russo, the Anvil agents and several NYPD officers, Castle confronts the tortured Lewis in the hotel kitchen before helping Karen disarm the bomb. Lewis Wilson retreats to the freezer, locking himself in as he rewires the bomb and detonates it, killing himself. With Frank now as the major suspect in the assassination attempt and the NYPD closing in on the kitchen, him and Paige fake a hostage situation that allows Frank to escape the hotel by zip wire. Whee! <laughs> that was a very interesting shot at the end of the episode, as Frank uses <laughs> zip wire to get across the street. Absolutely laughed my uh, not too insubstantial man boobs off. <laughs> I have to say now, uh, I just thought it was really funny. It reminded me of like sort of adventure weekend or adventure week with school um, back in the day where you'd do the zip line and it'd be like, oh, wow, this is really cool. But just to see that he had set that up in mm-hmm. anticipation. And absolutely, in terms of the character, he's not going to get himself into a situation that he can't get out of. A beautiful you know, line by Karen Page. Yeah, yeah. Really, um, it, it sums up that execution of a plan and a strategy from a military perspective. And I loved it. But it, I was expecting him to kind of like go, we, it remi- kind of reminded me to, uh, of Boris Johnson sort of stuck oh, no. on the zip wire. Right right? It was, like, it, was, was he going to suddenly get caught? He hadn't got the <laughs> tensile strength sort of across the, the, the span. But I mean, stuck in between two buildings in New York yeah. above the streets would have been quite hilarious, definitely. I had a little bit of the South Park zip lining episode, if you remember that one, <laughs> yeah. John, where uh, everybody's encouraged to shout zip line, woo, as they go across. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, yeah. uh, I just can't um, expect that from Frank. Though. It but, was just really, um, yeah, it, it felt really funny. Can I me. say it did? If he was in a Batman costume, it probably would have suited Batman, definitely. But um, but yeah. It, it but it would have been at enough. night as well, so true. it kind of would have looked like he was flying through the air. Very true, very true. But it does show Frank's upper body strength, given how many bullets he took to his um, flak jacket, mm-hmm. you know, and there is that moment that he pulls himself out of the out of the lift with both arms, even though one of them's been hanging at his side for a while. Like he is, he pushes through the pain in this episode. Oh, big time! But yeah. I, I think with that we can push through to the war journal. Um, yeah, this week we're taking a slightly different uh, perspective on it, in the mm-hmm. same way that I think the episode did. Uh, we're going to look at the different interviews of Detective Mahoney with uh, Senator Ori, Karen, Dina. And, of course, Russo, as well as then looking at the final aspect with regards to Lewis and Frank, which these four interviews all related to. Yeah, 
Yeah, interesting one. Let's go for our, our point number one, our case note number one for uh, the intro and Senator Aris's version of the story. Um, it's often said that someone's the hero of their own story. None more so than Senator Ari in this uh, in this particular version of the story. I love the laugh from Karen later on when she hears how he's described the situation where he, he picked up a gun, shot back and ran out of the room. Um, and Karen's kind of going, there is no way that happened with this guy. I believe she calls it total unadulterated bullshit Mm -hmm. yes yes but his version of the story is very melodramatic he does create this narrative for himself that he's the hero in in his own story Um, it's quite interesting though we've heard the last two episodes and in this episode as well we see Senator Ori wanting to take away guns completely from certain people he's very hard line on his stance his anti-gun stance Um, but we do get a little bit from him where he's going I've never been in a situation like this before is he questioning his position on this I don't think he'll ever change his position because he still has to go to that rally. But it feels like when he's having the conversation with the returning uh, Mahoney, uh, Officer Mahoney that we've seen right back to Daredevil season one. Cool to have him in here. It seems like when he's having the conversation with him about, have you ever been in this situation where you've been shot at? Because I haven't. It feels like he ha- has a new perspective on his uh, on his opinion, at least. Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, he talks about he's never held a gun before until mm-hmm. today, uh, you know. What does that do to him? Has he suddenly f- felt like he's got immense power mm. by by holding it and firing it in the way he describes his story? Yep. Um, but, you know, he also says how it played so fast and now it plays like slow motion. Right. Um, you know, that kind of change because of the adrenaline coursing through his veins. So it, it, it's really interesting. But I wonder how much now we will see of Ari. I think that this may be um, his last moment within yeah. this series. Yeah. Um, but I, it's really interesting, you know, having the conversation that he talks about society being safe enough and that the police should protect him. And yet in the interview that he has with Karen Page, um, you know, he's got private arm detail with the anvil boys um protecting him Mm -hmm. so it's kind of interesting that what he's saying and what he's doing you know there is some slight um contradiction there in in how he's trying to you know run that narrative yeah and that's definitely on purpose in the in the in the show it's interesting that he did say pretty much exactly what we said last week that our kind of position on gun control is we don't have guns in ireland the uk uh, we don't use them on a day-to-day basis, so we kind of feel that that society is set up with responsible people in control of those guns. And that's very much exactly the point that Senator Ori makes here. He says, why do you carry a gun, Karen? Um, that's what the police are supposed to do. So it's quite interesting that he's coming from that perspective. Uh, I do wonder if being in a situation just like the situation that caused Karen to buy her own gun to carry around in her bag is that now where Senator Rory is? He's never been in this situation before. Now that he is and goes, being a high-profile politician means I'm going to have to be surrounded by people holding guns or get a gun myself uh, because I'm going to be attacked again in the future. Is this now changing his position? I don't know whether, we'll, as you say, whether we'll ever see him again because the threat of Lewis is gone now, unless Lewis has inspired other followers who will carry on his so-called mission. Yeah, I mean, it will be interesting to see and um, how that plays out, or if it even does. And um, you know, this idea of you know followers of Lewis. I mean, mm. that is kind of an interesting thought that could be put into this. But I suspect now that we are definitely going to see the fallout um, from this episode between the main main characters. Definitely, yeah, totally agree. The one big difference in Ori's story from everybody else is he involves Frank uh, in this attack saying that Frank was working with Lewis, which is the believable narrative that the newspapers and the press have created. But he's the only person that specifically mentions Frank comes into the room behind Lewis and the two of them are working together. Everybody else sees it completely differently. So I think that was quite interesting from his point of view. It ultimately starts the the conversation that this was a pincer movement up each of the stairwells. Uh, One side Mm. was Lewis, one side was Frank to, to... execute their plan to assassinate him yeah. as well uh, and but in the end it's himself running to get help uh, whereas it looks like um you know i suppose moving into point two um we see that he just seems to barge karen out of the way mm-hmm. so that he can get free and escape yeah. um, and you know here we come to Karen trying to just smooth out those peaks and troughs of, of Senator Ori's um, bullshit uh, account of, of what happened. Mm-hmm. But 
nonetheless, Karen, in her own way, adulterates the truth of the situation. Absolutely. And I think in particular, the really interesting one is that Frank does the hero dive to take the bullet. I mean, this is classic Kevin Costner bodyguard uh, you know, jump in front of the bullet. Absolutely. And I think that's purposeful. That's really, it's it's so interesting. She is seeing this as, you know, that Frank is the guy who is honest. Mm-hmm. Um, he is doing stuff for good reasons and that he is selfless and will do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's an interesting point that you make that Karen has seen this from her perspective and from her perspective, Frank is the hero. It was quite interesting, this discussion between herself and Mahoney, because it really helps her conversation and really helps the scene, actually, that Mahoney is someone that she's known now for two years, probably, if the timeline is right there. About two years, maybe a little bit more. Um, she's known him for a long time. He worked the, the Punisher case back in season two of Daredevil. So he knows what Frank Castle is really about. Behind the headlines, behind the news coverage, behind even the court case, he knows what Frank is about. And I like that this is used by Karen to kind of try and exonerate Frank again. That is her purpose here. But it's kind of interesting that she doesn't really mention much of the Lewis storyline. Doesn't really mention much of what Lewis did when he came into the room. It's very much she's standing in front of Mahoney and going, drop this bit about Frank and focus on Lewis because he's the only one here that's the bad guy. Yeah, I mean, she really focuses on and pleads that Castle is not a terrorist. And, And really that, you know, if it wasn't for Frank... Um, her and Ari, Senator Ari, would be dead. Yeah. Um, you know, so it is total um, the hero moment of Castle here. And again, trying to, in some ways, bit by bit, piece by piece, restore Castle's reputation mm-hmm. within the eyes of the law. And she is the one that connects Mahoney immediately back into, you know, the events of Daredevil uh, series two yep. as well. You know, so it, it, it's really interesting how that plays out. But I think you get the sense towards um, the end of this episode when Mahoney is with Karen that he knows that she is effectively bigging up Frank here. Because yeah. as you say, he, he, she is completely ignoring uh, Lewis, um, really, within the story that she's trying to say. I like the reasoning that Mahoney gives for that is that she's writing her column. In her head, she's already writing her story for the front page of the news the following day. And Mahoney's going to go, and I'm trying to investigate it. I don't want to read it on the news tomorrow. I want to hear it from your lips right now in this room so I can do my job and I can investigate. And Karen is kind of keeping back some of those details so that she can write her version of the story. Like, nothing better than a journalist to be right in the center of of the action, you know. I, I, I do like that answer is given as to why she's holding back some of the details, even if it's not true. Yeah, and I mean, Mahoney here is saying, you know, just give him up. Give us the information mm-hmm. that you know about Castle. And, you know, he, he's really almost as well saying that to some extent she could be considered as uh, in contempt of, of any investigative procedure that the NYPD or even if it was in some way brought to court because she is not uh, giving away any information. She True. is withholding inf- or he feels that she is and... You know, her response back is, if Castle's a terrorist, I'm just a victim, that she would play it in in that way. And I I think it's really interesting, and I think this moves us on to point number three, Mm -hmm. that with with Dina Madani and her story, you know, there is that moment where um, Paige and and Madani cross paths here. And it is a really nice moment where she confronts Karen that she knows, Madani knows, that Karen lied to her in that um, office at the Homeland Security Agency Mm -hmm. when she asked Karen whether she knew that Frank was alive and where he was. I thought that was really interesting. And the the comeback from Karen is really good. Well, we both knew that he was alive. Exactly, yeah. You know, Um, it wasn't just me. And... I think that does lead to a really nice moment with these two ladies as well, where they go, and Frank has saved both our lives. Mm, you know, yeah. the idea that Frank pulled Madani from the, the burning car crash and, and the wreckage of it. And of course, Frank has also, um, you know, saved Paige's life as well. Yeah, yeah. And I like the fact that Dinah is now telling um, Karen that she is the one and the best hope for Frank to survive. 
I don't know whether she gives Frank enough credit because I know these are tough guys who work for Anvil and I know there's tough guys with Rollins and with uh, Billy Russo, but Frank's a tough guy. He's been able to fend off a lot of people. So I don't know whether it will convince him too much by saying, come to Dina, she has all the answers for you. She'll take you into protective custody. I have the feeling that even if she did, he'd still have to fight his way out of it. I mean, I think the great thing about that moment where she hands Karen the card and and says that is that is a reflection of her conversation with her uh, boss at Homeland Security Mm -hmm. where effectively, you know, that conundrum is that he is one of the two people along with um, Micro that can absolutely provide the truth behind what happened in Kandahar and with Operation Cerberus about Rawlins and and the bugging of her office. Yeah. All of that, which she tells her superior. Mm. Um, And so it'll be interesting. Is he a good or bad guy as well? It'll be interesting. He took that bug. I'm kind of like going, you know, maybe you should have kept hold of that, uh, Dina. Yeah. But nonetheless... It's a reflection of that conversation where, you know, he points out to to Dina that you now need to try and keep alive one of your key witnesses that everyone else is trying to hunt down uh, on the basis of, um, you know, his his front cover page with Lewis in the bulletin that he's a terrorist. And obviously, I suppose, later on with this assassination attempt and how that is at least initially being taken up, whether that's the the um, final version of it, Mm -hmm. don't know. But, you know, this is a real conundrum for Madani because she needs the one person that every other law enforcement agency is hunting down and who thinks is a terrorist. And you've got to assume that, even though we don't get to read the story, we don't get to actually see the actual wording of the story, you've got to assume that the way that the press is taking this is, this is Frank Castle who broke out of prison and was a terrorist and brought to court a year ago or so that he's now back and he's now convinced another young member of the army. So the the way it's probably taken is that Frank is the leader here. He's the most likely one to be responsible for this. Not Lewis. This isn't Lewis's plan. This is Frank's plan, I would say, is the way that they're going to take this in the press. So, of course, if you are in the NYPD, it would be a much bigger collar for you to get Frank and not Lewis. If you lose Lewis, hey, who cares? He's just one young kid. If you get Frank, you get him on all of the previous things that happened. You get him on the court case, you get him on the breaking out of prison, and you get him on this. So um, so I can understand why Mahoney's pursuing it, but it is. I love the fact that they've used a character that knows Frank and knows what happened in the past. It's not just some other detective in the NYPD who doesn't know anything about Frank. Absolutely. I think what's really good here as well is that we have the third interview that Mahoney is doing here with Dina Madani, mm. um, and it's the third version of the truth of what happened. And, I, you know, Madani herself is lying here as well. I think initially, I think there's a bit of a, a, a pissing contest between the fact of, um, you know, Madani as Homeland Security. Why is she being called in? Why is she the, you know, Mahoney wants to know, and he is NYPD. And I mean, t- to the point where Madani is quite, look, here's my badge. I'm going to leave now. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, she kind of pulls a, a you know my agency is better than your police force to an extent a little bit but ultimately you know what happens on in that stirwell during um the the sort of fallout of the assassination attempt she absolutely covers up um uh, from mahoney she has had a truth revealed to her here um which she is the one that wants to pursue it, and she's not going to allow any other law enforcement agent to to be involved in it. Um, and I find that really interesting as well. I mean, you do get that. I think you yeah. had that with Luke Cage to some extent, where you you had the FBI involved, but also Misty Knight was, you know, a local detective in the neighborhood who wanted to make sure that she was the one that was following up and trying yeah. to find out the the events going on in Luke Cage. Yeah. So this is a, a, another element of that, I think. Good call, good call. Um, let's talk about our, our fourth point, the interview with Russo. So Russo is probably what you would call the hostile witness here uh, of all of, all of yeah, the people. Big time. Everybody tells their version of a story here as to what went on. But the actual discussion between Mahoney and Russo, I think, is fantastic. I love the acting. 
in this scene between the two characters. I love Rousseau again in here, kind of, again, clashing up against somebody else that wasn't in the army. This idea of, did you ever serve to Mahoney, where he's going, um, we in the Marines believe you can lose somebody on a mission, but if the mission is a success, then it's a success we expect for people to die. And here he's saying this this mission, his mission to protect Ori, was successful because Ori is still alive. So it doesn't matter that he's lost four, five, six, ten guys. That doesn't matter. In this situation, he's won. His agency comes out on top. These guys have given their life for Ori, um, and that's what they're paid to do. So that's quite interesting where he's looking at it from that perspective. Uh, but he's really challenging and really pushing back against Mahoney. Oh, definitely. I, I mean, I love Mahoney's response here were, you know, I wear a shield. His is about the, the badge of the NYPD. Mm-hmm. And I, I think there's a, a, a similar kind of reflection here. It becomes very much this butting of heads of, you know, the shield of the NYPD versus the gun uh, and, and service of the Marines yeah. in the same way that Dina and Mahoney uh, really... There is that Homeland Security and NYPD. Yeah. You know, yeah. Again, butting heads here. But definitely Russo is absolutely, um, again, the the hostile witness here. Yeah. And again, makes a porky pie. Absolutely. But I do like the little play on words here between Mahoney and, and Russo. don't know whether you noticed this, John where he says to him, have you ever served? And, and Mahoney says, I wear the shield. On the badge of the MIPD is to protect and serve. So he's effectively saying, I didn't just serve in a war. I didn't just go over and do a couple of tours of duty. I serve every single day. And that's what's written on my shield. That's what's written on my contract that I sign as a police officer for the MIPD is that I serve. Uh, that's effectively what he's saying. I serve the people, not just an army. So nice little play on words from the writers there. Definitely. But here we have Russo covering up the fact that actually Frank has informed him that Lewis is going to make a play Mm -hmm. against Senator Ori. Um, And Russo does nothing to prevent that. It's um, interesting. Or to assist to allow Frank to come in uh, and stop him. And ultimately, this becomes uh, the moment where Russo... Uh, really unravels himself over the course of the events mm-hmm. because that moment in the stairwell where you have Frank, Russo, and Dina Madani, immediately after that, I was thinking, why did Russo kind of give himself up here? Yeah. You know, what was, why did the truth come out on that stairwell? You know, why did he say to Madani, it was war, Dina? Um, you know, this really blowing his cover. And that's because he shot Frank. Frank knew that Russo knew that he was going to be there to try and save Ari. He asked for Russo to to help with that. And in the end, Frank finds that it is Russo that has just shot at him in the stairwell under the pretense that he's trying to protect uh, Madani. Love the reaction of uh, of Frank to that shot just as he he realizes that's Bill. That's Billy Russo, his friend, who has just spoken to him on the phone earlier on that day saying, I can protect you, Frank. And now he's taking a shot at him and won't stand down. It's a great little moment. That whole moment on the stairs is, is, is fantastic. But there's a couple of moments throughout the episodes, two specifically. One after the conversation with Frank on the phone and this moment with Madani where he reveals himself, where you get that really cocky smile from Billy Russo. Um, he just smiles to himself and to the world to effectively go, I am pretty evil here. Um, yeah. I, do, I do understand what I've done here. and I believe I'm in the right. I think the... The smile after the call with Frank, I feel that that's because he believes in his anvil men and thinks if he can lead Frank into that room and let Frank think that he's on his side, that his men will get the shot and kill Frank. Definitely. Um, He's set up this whole operation in the hotel that if anybody comes into the hotel, they will be taken out by his guys. Anybody that, that shouldn't, that doesn't belong there will be taken out by anvil. So I think he feels a bit overconfident in his own men. And then the smile on the stairs I think it's just before he gets taken down that he smiles at Madani and that seems to be she's found out and I've got a gun trained and I'm absolutely going to get the shot off before she gets shot off back on me and then he gets taken down. So Yeah, but it's interesting of all the, the, the four interviewees that, that Mahoney is talking to, it is the lie that Russo gives in his interview with Mahoney that he has never seen Frank, he's not been in contact with him, yeah. that ultimately comes back in that stirwell to to really bite him in the ass because he did know that Frank was going to be there and Frank knows that and that is the issue. Yeah. And I have to say, 
uh, there's no sweeter justice than that happening, to be honest, uh, to, to Russo. I have to say as well, you know, given we see Madani, um, earlier on in the episode going back to work for the first time mm -hmm. and, and that knowing nod of the camera to St Stein's old desk. Yeah. I, absolutely love the fact that when they're all getting arrested by the NYPD and Frank's making his escape, uh, Dina turns to him and says, you're going to wish you shot me. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, she's got the fire in the eyes now, and that's going to be pretty special to see that retribution, I uh, think. Absolutely. Can I ask just one question about the about the stairwell? Again, I've, I've only held a gun when doing practice on, uh, on a, a gun range, but... What I've been told is you never put anything in front of a gun after it's just been shot because it gets quite hot, um, is what I've always been told. There's a moment here where Frank walks up to Medina directly after she shot the bullet into the stairs and puts the, the gun directly to his head. I was waiting for him to move away from it and see a big burn mark on his head afterwards. <laughs> is that, would that be right, John? Would that be... I don't your, know, to your be experience? honest. No, don't know. <laughs> never put a gun to my head just in case uh, someone's finger uh, slips or something like that. You never want to do that. No, absolutely. I, but I, I think one final thing with Russo is, you know, Madani has... Her suspicion has been raised about at least anvil mm -hmm. um you know russo makes the the pleading case that you know he hires these people it's nothing to do with him but that the files on the four men that were shot in that sting operation yeah. do show that an affiliation with anvil and it's all of them so her suspicions you know do get raised here yeah. uh, for at least anvil but there is a bit of a I really liked the acting in that moment where she and Russo are talking in the lobby of the hotel mm -hmm. because she really does l look across his face, try, you know, you see her trying to analyze it. I just thought it was so well done. Yeah, it's kind of a, a have I been wrong about you all this time, even though we've been in those really close moments for this many episodes, even though they've been this close, could she have been wrong about them this long? And there's one other person that doesn't get to be interviewed by... Uh, by Mahoney, obviously, for obvious reasons, as we see as the episode fully plays out. I really liked how this episode played out, I must say. I didn't, you know, the, the surprise, I suppose, of, of how it all ended. Um, but there's Lewis, obviously. You know, there's, there's this character of Lewis who's finally reaching the crescendo of his storyline. Um, but it all starts out with him going over to one of the Anvil guards at home, shooting him through the door. Nice touch that he's using the bulletin uh, to cover up his face and shoots the guard through that uh, because of how angry he is at uh, the bulletin for what they've done and how they've changed his story and how they've twisted what they did. It's just a nice touch because it just shows how angry he is at Karen. Uh, I'm surprised he didn't put a bullet in her head the minute he arrived into that room because it does seem like a lot of his aggression is about that Karen has taken a side and it's not the one he expected or wanted her to take, but now she's an enemy. I expected for him to just kill her, take her out, and then take Ori as the, as the uh, captive and then set his bomb and his plan in motion. But that's it. That's an interesting point because I actually did feel that Lewis going in there, it was just going to simply be bang, bang, and you're dead. Mm -hmm. And I really felt that both for Senator Ori and for Karen, he completely hesitated. Yeah. I don't know whether, as you say, did he intend on taking a hostage? I'm not too sure that he did. Um, you know, he is wired up and maybe that was a backup play. Did he intend on, on doing that? in that way mm -hmm. for me in, in looking at how he executed the the anvil guards and and going bursting in there with the stun grenades uh, and the explosives to break down the door i really thought he was going to go in and it would be a shot to the head to ari i thought that was going to be the statement and the same with page yeah and he absolutely hesitates here for for some reason and maybe that is because he was going to take um, a hostage yes yes possibly he does take a shot though there's no doubt in that because we do get that from karen's story that he takes the shot and and frank dives and blocks the shot whether that's exactly true or exactly what happened um but yes he doesn't kill either of them uh he already gets out of there and karen is taken hostage um to get him out of the building it seems like so it doesn't look like he's a suicide bomber um, it looks like no, he was trying to get out of there, but was willing to kill himself if it came down to that. Is kind of where we where we get to. Yeah, and I mean, ultimately, we find him the in the kitchen uh, of the hotel, oh, holding yeah. Karen hostage. Um, you know, with a, a release detonator, so that if he's shot, 
it will release and explode. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's really, um, it's actually really quite upsetting. You know, he finds himself in a sense cornered as far as he's concerned. Um, And he starts recounting it's ruinous to run from a fight, Mm -hmm. wait for support, you know, wait for support. And he's kind of recounting all this. He's trying to, you know, he will get support from the army he, it's almost tragic. Well, it is tragic. It is, yeah. Because um, he's effectively rolling his life back to the first time yeah, he entered exactly. the army and the first words that were spoken to him to get him into this situation where he's able to put up with killing people. Yeah, and he speaks to Karen, you know, you could have been part of the solution and you went against me. Yeah. He, he's, you know, he's really now in this position where it's desperate for him. Yeah. And as you say, it's recounting it through and he's he's projecting onto Karen that you aren't part of the solution. You didn't help me. Mm -hmm. He's waiting for support. It's not coming. You know, it's ruinous to run from a fight to to get himself perked up so that he can fight because he is in a kitchen with nowhere to go with his hand on, on a detonator that if it releases, he is going to blow up. I have to also say the talk down that's going on with Frank talking to Karen through his conversation with Lewis about which wire to pull to keep herself safe. Um, you assume if someone's building bombs like Lewis has many times now that they're building the same way every time. The white sw- the white cable is the one that controls whether it goes off or not, just like it did with Curtis's one the previous time. I like how it's done. I love that Karen saves herself effectively in this situation because Frank has been able to give her the information that she needs to get herself out of the situation. Uh, I just think it's really smart. It's very, very smartly written and very smartly played between the two characters. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really enjoyed how uh, Frank was using his conversation to really um, tell Karen Get the white wire, you've got a gun in your bag, and ultimately it works out. Mm-hmm. Um, and But Lewis retreats into the pantry, the locked pantry or the freezer. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's really interesting. You know, was Frank trying to talk him down or not there? I mean... Um, it feels like in that scene, because it it's a very intense scene, but you're right, it does kind of feel like Frank is saying, go ahead and do it uh, to him. Um, which is kind of a Punisher thing to do, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it feels like something that the Punisher would do. He wouldn't kill him himself, but if the guy's willing to take himself out, well, go right ahead. No skin off Frank's nose. And then that problem's out of his way. Yeah, but I mean, unfortunately, it is the tragic ending yeah. of uh, Lewis Wilson's life. Um, you know, he's he's gone down a, a course of, of action that has led to him being alone in a hotel freezer or pantry wiring himself up to explode. Mm -hmm. I think one of the saddest moments as well, I think that really makes that hit home um, is the fact that, you know, when him and Frank are talking, Frank says, think about your father. He's going to have terrorists written on his house. And you see Lewis going, leave my dad out of this. You know, that, that moment where he becomes a son, he, he becomes, you know, that kid that, and has that relationship with his dad and it all just feels so really um tragic and yeah. it, it was it's really quite powerful but ultimately lewis goes boom in the pantry yes oh but it, like it's it's a tough moment to watch and as you say that moment where frank talks about his father is yeah probably the most difficult moment of that with lewis because it feels like he hasn't thought about it despite the fact that that's exactly what happens to the family members who are left behind after something like this situation. Um, it's a fabulous scene, though. Yeah, yeah really it, it is really good. Yeah, really sad. But yes, Frank escapes by using Karen again. Um, yeah. Can I ask a question? Because I think there's a problem here in the episode. Okay. I'm always asking you questions, even though you, you saw the exact same episode that I did. Um, so Karen shoots Lewis in the foot. Yes. With her gun in her bag. Yes. Where did she get that gun? Because we know at the beginning of the episode she has the conversation specifically with Russo that she's lost her own gun. Um, He says, you'll get it back when you come back downstairs. But she never goes back downstairs after the interview with Ari. That's where she's attacked in the room by Lewis and then taken captive by him and brought downstairs in the lift and then Frank goes after him. So 
there's no real opportunity for her to have taken a gun. Again, it depends on whose version of the story you got here. So is it the gun that Ori picked up in his version of the story to shoot back at Lewis? Is that what Karen picked up and put in her bag? Maybe. It's quite difficult here because of the unreliable narrators that we've got going on. Yeah, but does Frank know that? And, I mean, we do see on a number of the different narrations that are done that Ori leaves with the gun. Mm -hmm. So it could potentially be some kind of continuity error. Possibly, because Frank is saying to her, you're a creature of habit, uh, Karen, and she starts patting her bag for her gun. So there is that moment. So it feels like it should be her own gun in that bag, but we know from that conversation that's very specific from Russo earlier on that she's a gun carrier. She won't get her gun back until after she's finished the meeting with, with the senator. So just wondering if, if you thought that was unusual that she had the gun in her in her bag. Um, but there are explanations in the story where it could have come from, I suppose. No, definitely. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we get Zipline Frank. Well, we do get one other thing beforehand. We have Frank and Karen in the elevator. And I was looking at the screen going, ooh, Matt Murdock's not going to be happy about this. There is absolutely a moment where these two characters are definitely getting very close to starting a relationship. <laughs> I actually thought the way John Bernthal played that was exceptional because mm -hmm. he had on his face an expression of absolute longing to want to kiss Karen, right? but realizing that it would ruin everything or that, you know, maybe the memory of his wife popped up during that moment. But I thought the eyes in particular that John Bernthal had, because actually, yeah, it's Karen who, who, who kind of steps back. Yes. Um, I thought it was really, really well done. Um, you know, and I'm so glad they didn't kiss. Yes. Um, but that possibility that they could have kissed and didn't, I thought was, so well acted yeah, I agree. Uh, I agree. by those two in in the elevator and especially with John Berntel. It, it was almost just like the pain of it that he can't have a normal relationship anymore because yeah. of what he's committed himself to do despite being so close. And sold in a look, as you say. It does have that feeling of if they were locked in the lift for a little while or if there was a bottle of rosé in there, maybe. Um, they, <laughs> they may have pursued it, but I'm glad they didn't. But I definitely, watching it, I was going, Matt's going to be unhappy if he ever finds out how close this happened with this game. But, uh, but we'll find out. We know that Karen thinks that Matt is no longer around and no longer in the picture. So uh, so it'll be interesting to see if this if this continues. It'll be interesting to see if we if we have these two together again. It ends with Karen talking to Mahoney saying, I sincerely do not know where Frank Castle is. So maybe we won't see her in the series again. This, uh, this feels like the wrap-up of the Lewis storyline kind of takes out the bulletin connection, but we know that Frank cares for, for Karen, so he'll, he'll see her again at some point in the future. Yeah. No big notes for this episode, but I do kind of think this is the most Punisher-like episode of the show. We, I know Chris had mentioned a few times, uh, and we've talked about this before we recorded, John. Um, Chris talked about a few times that the show doesn't have that many Easter eggs for comic books in general or for particular storylines. But this feels like the most comic book Punisher we've seen, really, uh, in the show. He's able to cover himself up and get into this uh, this building to take out his target like Lewis and able to find his way out at the end with his zip line. Woo. Um, but he's also able to do some quite incredible things, as I say, being able to pull himself up on top of the lift with one broken arm or one arm that's been shot. Um, that's quite, quite a significant Punisher-type move. Uh, you'll never get this guy down. The moment where he stand, has a standoff with the Anvil agents with uh, Lewis and Karen in between them, and the minute they walk away, Anvil pull out their guns, shoot him. He rolls across the floor, grabs a body of a, of a downed Anvil agent, uh, and drags it behind him as it's being shot to protect himself. Like These are all Punisher moments. They're not just... Definitely. moments from drama shows like he takes a lot of bullets in in this episode mm -hmm. like in that elevator at the end i was kind of thinking how is he going to pull himself up yeah how, how is he going to take hold himself up on the zip line yeah you know um like he takes a lot of beating a lot of punishment um and that is very much punisher yeah. as well yeah. you know and he has this that strength to overcome the pain because of that bullet lodged in his brain 
Oh yeah, that's the bullet hole that was revealed in his, uh, the X-ray in season two of Daredevil. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Nice. No, good memory, John. Good memory. On that note, I think we need to get on to our defense for the episode. Um, John, do you defend the tenth episode of The Punisher, Virtue of the Vicious? I do defend this episode of The Punisher. Uh, I would give this five zip lines out of five. Oh, yeah. I, um, <laughs> I really love the, the four different narratives of the events that go down in Senator Ori's uh, hotel room. I think it's really interesting. I love the fact that each one of them, in their own way, for different reasons, provides a lie, and of, of which one really comes back to to bite them on the ass and that's Russo um I find it an interesting way that Russo uh, is revealed to be one of those bad guys from Kandahar mm-hmm. but uh, I love the fact that it is predicated on his lie to Mahoney about having seen Frank I think it's really good I think there's a really good wrap up of a, a number of different story threads uh, in particular the Lewis one oh, yeah. um, and just how tragic that is yes it's extreme um, but these extreme things um, have happened and I, I think it's a, a really good way um, from having seen in the previous episode you know that mirror of Lewis as a as a as another different version of how Frank could have gone yeah uh, and, and what he's doing uh, to see here that those final moments uh, are between Frank and Lewis I think it really um, Lewis that moment where he says, don't talk about my dad, is massively um, heart-wrenching, to be honest, mm-hmm. um, especially given that he then goes um, and and blows himself up, especially after recounting all the stuff he's been taught in the army. Um, it was it was pretty tragic, that, uh, but I really liked it. And I absolutely love the kahunas that Dina Madani uh, shows here <laughs> when she stands up to Russo to say, you know, you should have shot me. Uh, you are going down. Uh, I like this, and I'm really excited to see how this pushes now into the, the final three episodes. I mean, for me, at this moment in time... I really don't think uh, The Punisher um, has had a dud episode. Um, You know, okay, episode one was very much an opener and uh, very standard. But I think, you know, we have to be mindful that not everyone knows about The Punisher. It's a nice introduction. uh, But I'm really excited to see um, episodes 11, 12, and 13 as we move towards the end here. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering... Will, at least for me, the Punisher break that duck that um, Chris has always said about having that lull moment within these 13 episode series? Um, I personally don't feel that that's really happened yet. Mm. Um, I've been absolutely hooked on uh, the way these stories have strung together through the series and then how in a particular episode like this episode 10, you have that really nice um, structure to the episode of the four different narratives. And yet ultimately going, well, which Frank do you want? Almost to an extent. Terrorist Frank, Hero Frank, um, doesn't exist Frank, and doesn't exist in an evil way Frank. You know, Madani trying to protect her case, or Russo trying to make sure he gets his kill of, of, of Frank. Mm-hmm. So I absolutely defend this episode of The Punisher. Derek, do you defend Virtue of the Vicious? You had a lot to say there, John, Uh, and I don't have a huge amount more to say. This is an excellent episode of the series. I had a chat about uh, this kind of point of the uh, of. This season with uh, one of her friends over on over on Twitter, uh, Lauren Galloway, the other day, um, where she feels that a lot of people have slept on this series. A lot of people haven't watched the series because nobody's talking about it. Um, that is the challenge with a lot of the Netflix shows that people can watch it in a day and then they just won't talk about it again. This does seem to have slipped under the radar a little bit, but I absolutely feel this episode and the last couple of episodes, there's some Emmy winning performances in here. There's some fantastic moments. John Bernthal's killing it. And I'm so sorry to have lost Daniel Weber as an actor on this show, but it's very important that his character uh, of Lewis gets to this end point before the series ends. It, it can't, you can't have had this big of a climax in the final episode of the series as Frank's taking down his other enemy in the show. It's good that it's come this way. It's good that it's filled up 
the middle of the series. And as you say, John, over and over again, there's been wonderful episodes in the show. Um, what I love about this episode is the change of structure. You can't do this every episode, of course, uh, but I love the change of structure here where you have four different perspectives trying to tell one person who's just looking for the truth and none of the four perspectives are correct or are telling him the truth. All of them are unreliable narrators. All of them are trying to protect themselves in the situation or in the case of of, uh, of Senator Ori, taking the opportunity to make themselves look like a hero. You know, uh, I really like those ideas. I really like how it, how it came off in this episode. Um, and I do feel really sorry for Mahoney because has he come out of it with enough information to follow up on anything at all here? Or does he just have to close the gate case and go, well, I was told that Frank wasn't involved in it and Lewis is dead now. So does it really matter? Uh, I do kind of feel sorry for the character Mahoney. Not for the first time. He's, he's kind of been screwed over a few times in the in the Defender series. Uh, but really good to see, see him back in the show as well and connect it all back up in the universe of the Defenders. Okay, so next on to some feedback that we've gotten in uh, through Facebook. Remember, you can head on over and join our Facebook group over at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Defenders TV podcast. Mm -hmm. And as we said earlier, if you want to, please send in your thoughts, discussion points or comments on any episode of the Punisher by email through feedback at defenders TV podcast.com. Leave a voicemail through our website over at defenders TV podcast.com. Um, but our f- first bit of feedback comes from f- our Facebook group by Robert Phillips. Finally, the threads are woven together in an explosive episode that underlines a few of the morals of this tale. Mm-hmm. The heroic self sacrifice line stays clear through Lewis. A trope I'm growing to hate more and more, <laughs> and the good guy Frank is in lights for saving the day all around. Billy gets uncovered, and Madani sets her sights on the real baddies. Really good talk down scene again with a trio and a bomb. I particularly like the way Karen saved herself, despite being damseled by the terrorists. Very true. But where next? Can Frank find Micro and cook up a plan to take Rollins down? Can Madani destroy Russo without killing him? Can the rule of law return to New York for just one episode? And the baddies are arrested and tried. This episode a week thing is a killer now. We're so sorry for that, Robert. Uh, Thanks so much for your feedback, as always. Great to hear from you. It's tough, isn't it? Uh, this is probably the longest we're going to spend on one show, uh, just because of the situation, just because of when it was released and with with the holiday period and with a couple of holidays for for some of our uh, some of our hosts. So this is the longest we spent with the show. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, you know, if, just like the way I watched Homeland when it came out first, or the way I watched Lost. It's a week to week show for us now. Um, at the first time we've done it, we used to have two episodes a week and start off our show with three or four episodes out in the first weekend. It's probably a little bit long because we know that the tail on it's not like that for a lot of people but we can see from our downloads that people are just joining us now and have watched the first four or five episodes over the christmas break yeah i mean it's really interesting we have taken the netflix model of of the the series dump on a given day and Uh we've turned it into the 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 new netflix experiment which is star trek discovery by going week by week it's kind of really interesting um you know the two different approaches that netflix are taking here i'm totally with you here robert the episode week by week really is a killer um i suspect you may be one of the only listeners that is doing it week (laughs) by week however i am sure most people are already through the 13 episodes and are maybe now watching it again possibly Mm -hmm. um but certainly yeah it, it really is a killer well, what I do like about uh, about the podcast is that at some point in the future, there's going to be people that will come to the show for the first time. So, uh, so it's good to be able to cover these each, just one episode, each episode that we discuss. So you can pick it up whenever you want to as you watch the episodes along. And um, thanks so much for your feedback as well, Robert. Itself, the actual feedback about the episode. I'm um, glad you enjoyed the episode as much as we did. It seems uh, you're you're looking forward to the next couple of episodes coming up. Uh, and totally agree with you. I did say it in the podcast itself that uh, I like that Karen saves herself. I like that she's not just a damsel in distress in here and saved by the Punisher. Uh, he saved enough people in the building and uh, and obviously Senator Rory by his actions. So it's nice to see somebody else being a bit of a hero, even if it's just saving themselves. Yeah. 
Uh, just another quick piece of feedback from Jeff Charles. He says, I'm really enjoying The Punisher, but I'm not sure what purpose Lewis serves in the series. Is it just to be a contrast to Frank? Uh, Robert responded to this one as well, said, good question. To me, I think it's a story that takes almost the same notes and plays them differently to show how it might have been with a tweak and a wobble. I think it's also an adversary for Frank that isn't an enemy to develop our understanding of his sense of honor further. And Rebecca also replied saying, he's a fake Moon Knight. Um, which isn't, which isn't <laughs> true at all. Lewis does have mental problems, but not in the same way that, uh, that our, our favorite, uh, Moon Knight character from Marvel Comics, uh, uh, would have dealt with the situation. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it is a really good question, Jeff, because I, I know there's been other people as well that have asked that question, you know, that they've found it difficult with Lewis's, um, storyline. I think the, what I would say is, yeah, as Robert has said, um, you know, it's not a contrast to Frank. It is a mirror of Frank. And I think in particular for episode nine, you get that moment where you have to try and distinguish what are the differences between the two mm-hmm. uh, for one to be reviled and one to be seen uh, as honorable, yeah. particularly by the different uh, characters. In particular, Karen, you know, why is it that she goes against Lewis but stays with Frank and it, it is loyal to Frank? Same with Curtis. It's the different way the notes are played, as Robert has said. It's also how a similar situation is viewed differently by the characters around the two yeah. as well. Yeah. That's how I kind of take it, Absolutely. is that it's more of a reflection of Frank, uh, a mirror that he, even he has to determine, am I just like Lewis in what I'm doing? Yeah. Which I think is most clearly um, seen in episode nine. Yeah. Yeah, I think I mentioned earlier on in the season that the big problem, I suppose, with Frank Castle as a character is that he's not a very open character, I suppose, in his discussions. He's quite a quiet character. He doesn't say a huge amount of words. So the character was always going to be defined in this show by the people that surrounded him. And, and I think the choice of using Lewis in here is a great a great idea. I think Steve Lightfoot, the showrunner, had a really good idea of what he wanted to get across with the show. He seems to be coming from the attitude of, we're not just making a show to have a show on, on Netflix, to, to just fill up the hours to, to keep people involved. We're going to make something that means something in the future and can be talked about. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to talk about the show the way it's been put together. And I love all these different perspectives of people that have come back from war and the impact that the war has had on them and the impact that their time serving the country has had on them um, and I love Lewis as a character particularly I think I've called him out almost every episode he's been in as being one of the features for the episode absolutely so, um, how some great. yeah absolutely and you know how some people just fall through the gap that mm-hmm. that, that is of support that is there by voluntary groups, official groups, yeah. or, or whatever? Um, it's not really, like nobody really tried to save Lewis. Yeah, you know, exactly. There's many, many opportunities there to be, um, to be saved, but uh, it just looks like he wasn't able to be saved in the show. Thanks so much for the feedback. Really good to hear from you. We've only got another couple of episodes left to get your feedback in. As John mentioned, just email them into feedback at defenderstvpodcast.com or join us over in our Facebook group. And we will have a new episode out every week for the next couple of weeks. Absolutely. And please um, subscribe to the podcast. Rate us, leave a review on any of your favorite podcast catchers. 2018 is all about sharing the love of the Defenders and Defenders TV podcast. Mm -hmm. Sharing the podcast is really good for us and any feedback is more than welcome. Uh, You can head on and subscribe on Apple Podcast, Google Play or any podcast catcher of your choice, just head on over to DefendersTVPodcast.com and to our subscribe section, and you can choose from a huge range of podcast catchers. A smorgasbord. A smorgasbord, indeed. (laughs) Um, We will be back with our review of The Punisher, Episode 11, Danger Close, next Friday, the 19th of January, and then every week from then on in for the remaining two episodes. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be back again next week. Looking forward to talking. I hope you're enjoying listening to our discussions about the Punisher as much as we're enjoying talking about them. And we'll be back with our third co-host, Chris, next week, we hope. Yes, unless he's been devoured by a meat-eating rhino. Oh, dear. I, ho- I hope not. Yes, I hope not, too. And <laughs> um, As always, it has been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks. Yes. Thanks, John. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and with our listeners, obviously. Okay. And, uh, yes, I'm off to go... Zip line.
Zipline John. Exactly. Uh, we will speak with you again next time. Bye. Bye. But I'm gonna tell you what to do. When you ain't got no money.